Maug, Alauren, and Caligon the Black, three of the most famous dragons that J.R.R. Tolkien created during his time. He had a great fascination with these incredible creatures, and today we are going to look at their origins, evolution, and their characteristics to better understand everything that we need to know about the dragons of Middle Earth. Remember everyone, if you find this video helpful, informative or entertaining today, please remember to hit that subscribe button below. By subscribing, you'll never miss out on any of our latest videos and you'll be supporting us to continue creating great content like this. As we look today at the enchanting world that Tolkien created, we will first travel back over 70 years to the 18th of December 1949. when. Professor Tolkien wrote to a Mrs. Naomi Mitchison. The professor discusses a couple of other topics, but then he goes on, if unprovoked it would seem, to talk about dragons in this letter. And in this video, we will explore their incredible origins, fascinating transformations, and discover what the brilliant professor himself had to say about these mythical creatures. I merely wanted to gaze upon your magnificence, to see if you really were as great as the old tales say. I find dragons a fascinating product of imagination, but I don't think the Beowulf one is frightfully good. But the whole problem of the intrusion of the dragon into northern imagination and its transformation there is one I do not know enough about. Fafnir in the late Norse versions of the Sigurd story is better, and Smaug and his conversation obviously is in debt there. The letters of J.R.R. Tolkien are such an incredibly unique way to give us insight into the way he thought, and you will almost always find something relevant to a question you have about something within his greater legendarium, like, how many dragon species were there? Were there more clans, other kinds? Are there any persistent myths about what the legend does say or does not? So continuing on to another letter to the same Naomi Mitchison, where this time Tolkien is replying to a specific question about dragons beyond the time of Smaug and the quest of Erebor from The Hobbit, and he says, Some stray answers, dragons. They are not stopped, since they were active in far later times, close to our own. Have I said anything to suggest the final ending of dragons? If so, it should be altered. The only passage I can think of is volume 1 page 70. There is not now any dragon left on earth in which the old fire is hot enough. But that implies, I think, that there are still dragons, if not of full primeval stature. Dragons are a common element in myths and stories from around the world. It is not surprising that the modern father of fantasy, J.R.R. Tolkien, included dragons in his own works. He created a collection of stories known as The Legendarium, which obviously includes books like The Silmarillion, Unfinished Tales, and the History of Middle-earth Anthology. These stories show how Tolkien's ideas developed over time, and it is fascinating to see. Tolkien's interest in dragons started early, and he was fascinated by how different cultures portrayed these creatures. He introduced four dragons in his stories, as well, four named dragons I should say, and inspired by Norse mythology, his dragons are clever, intelligent, and can speak in mesmerising ways. Think of how Glaurung, the first of the dragons, could not fly, yet he was extremely dangerous because of the way he caused people to go absolutely mad, able to twist their minds and drive them to suicide or murder, which we would argue is a more dangerous trait than throwing fire at a distant enemy. In the first version of the Fall of Gondolin, which comes from the Lost Tales, we see the story's foundation that later appears in the Silmarillion. Morgoth, the great dark lord, sent mechanical war machines in the shape of dragons, carrying orcs as passengers. This idea was then, yes, changed in the published The Silmarillion, where real dragons attack the city instead. During this time, there were no dragons with wings. They hadn't been created or changed into flying dragons yet. That transformation happened in the same age as Ancalagon the Black. By the end of the Third Age, dragons were breeding in the northern lands and in the withered heath north of the Grey Mountains. Tolkien's inspirations for dragons included Fafnir, the dragon from Beowulf, and the legend of Saint George and the Dragon. In his stories, dragons can have four legs and not fly, like Glaurung, or they can have wings and fly, like Smaug. The winged dragons first appeared in the War of Wrath, a battle that ended the First Age. 
Dragons can also be called fire drakes or uruloke because they breathe fire. It's not entirely clear if the uruloke only refers to the first dragons like Glaurung who breathe fire and couldn't fly, or if it does include any dragon that can breathe fire like Smaug. Tolkien mentions in Appendix A of The Lord of the Rings that Dane the First, King of Durin's folk, and his son Fror were killed by a cold dragon, or in other words, the cold drakes. This event led these people to leave the Grey Mountains. It is thought that this dragon couldn't breathe fire, but instead could breathe ice, which could be just as terrifying. However, this aspect has never really been explored in any more than these few sentences, so we don't know any more than that. One thing about Dragonfire though, especially with Ancalagon the Black, is that it wasn't hot enough to mount the One Ring, even though it could destroy lesser rings like the four Dwarven Rings that were consumed by Dragonfire. All of Tolkien's dragons do share some common traits. They love to collect and hoard treasure. They're smart in a subtle way. They're incredibly strong and they possess a kind of magic called the Dragon Spell. These traits make them very dangerous, however, they take a long time to grow up. For example, Glaurung emerged too early and wasn't fully powerful when he fought in the Dagor Bragolak. In fact, Malkor's first attempt to use dragons against his enemies failed because they were not strong enough. Yet. You cannot save him from the fire. He will burn. Tolkien wrote about only four named dragons in his time. And we'll talk about each of them now separately, at least kind of briefly. Let's start with Glaurung. Glaurung is known as the father of dragons in Tolkien's stories. He's the first of the Uruloke, which are the fire-breathing dragons of Angband. He plays a major role in the Children of Hurin story, a more detailed version of the story that is found in the Silmarillion as well. In that story, Glaurung sets events in motion that lead to the tragic fate of Turin Taramba. Glaurung can control and manipulate people's minds. He even erased her and sister Nienor's memories, though she does regain them and her sanity after Glaurung's death. Glaurung is a great worm with four legs. He breathes fire, but he cannot fly. Don't be mistaken, not being able to fly doesn't make him any less dangerous though, as we touched on before. Flying isn't necessary for a dragon to cause massive destruction. Remember that. The second most famous dragon though, right after Glaurung of course, is Ancalagon the Black. His name comes from the Sindarin words that mean rushing jaws and unrestrained. As told in the Silmarillion, Ancalagon was a dragon bred by Morgoth during the First Age. He was one of Morgoth's most vital servants created to be the mightiest dragon ever, the first of the winged fire drakes. He arose from Dor Daedaloth, Morgoth's land emerging from Angband with incredible force, like a mighty storm of wind and fire from the depths of Angband itself under the Iron Mountains. During the climax of the War of Wrath, when Morgoth's forces clashed with the Valar, and Calagon led a group of winged dragons against the Valar. The attack was so intense that the Valar were pushed back from Angband's gates to the ashy plain of Anfauglith. Eärendil, along with Thorondor the Eagle and the Great Eagles of Manwë, fought fiercely against Ancalagon and his dragons. The battle raged day and night, until Eärendil emerged victorious. He and the Eagles managed to bring down Ancalagon onto the three-headed towers of Thangorodrim, destroying both Ancalagon and the towers. It is in fact this statement that can cause a big divide in opinion on exactly the size of Ancalagon. Was he literally big enough to fall on these towers and destroy them, or was this more just some clever wordplay? But anyway, this victory was a significant turning point. With his powerful champion gone, Morgoth was defeated and captured, ending the War of Wrath and the First Age. Interestingly here too, Tolkien's dragons have even influenced real life scientific naming. In 1977, an extinct type of worm was named Ancalagon, and also in 1980, an extinct type of carnivorous mammal was named Ancalagon with a K in tribute to Tolkien's work too. Next, let's talk about Scather. Scather was a powerful dragon that also could not fly, living in the Grey Mountains. We don't know much about Scather, but we do know that Fram, a person from the Eotheid, killed him in the early days when the people of Aeol gathered there. Scather's name might come from an old word, Skea, which means someone who does bad things, like a criminal or a thief. Tolkien, who loved languages, probably, and almost obviously, knew about these meanings. After Fram killed Scather, there was a disagreement with the dwarves about who should have the treasure that Scather had been guarding. 
Long story short, the Aotheid end up with the treasure, and at the end of the War of the Ring, Eowyn gives Merry a silver horn that was said to be part of that treasure. It is so good to see how some things come back around. Then the final dragon we'll talk about is of course, Smaug. Bard, who we all know being related to Girion, the Lord of Dale, is the one that kills Smaug with the Black Arrow. Smaug's story is obviously part of The Hobbit or The Quest of Erebor, so it's one that many of us know so well already. Smaug was a dangerous dragon that could breathe fire. He was smart and could even tell if something so small was taken from his treasure hoard. He knew the very value of each piece of treasure he had and even the ones in the neighbouring Dale, but he wanted to keep everything for himself even though he did not use any of it. Smaug is described as red gold with gems on his belly, but the one weak spot in Smaug's armour was under his belly too, near his left chest. It was Bilbo Baggins of course who found out about this spot, and how Bilbo learning this led to the thrush to Tal Bard, and that is how Smaug was then defeated, bringing an end to the last great fire breathing dragon in Middle Earth over Escaroth. Although Smaug caused such tremendous damage in his time, it is also worth noting that when looking at the dragons of Middle-earth as a whole, Smaug was really nothing compared to some of his great ancestors. A terrifying thought to behold. I am death. So there we have it. The dragons of Middle-earth envisioned by J.R. Tolkien are not mere mythical creatures. They are intricate embodiments of his imagination and inspiration. As we delved into these majestic beasts, origins, evolution and characteristics, it becomes clear that the dragons occupy a unique place within Tolkien's expansive legendarium. Tolkien's exploration of dragons show that they are not limited to a single era, but extended into later times, suggesting that dragons do continue to exist even beyond the stories that we know. They draw from sources like Norse mythology and ancient legends, and he crafted dragons that possessed both immense physical strength and profound intelligence. In the grand scheme of Tolkien's universe, Smaug's reign of terror is a mere echo of what the might and menace of the dragons before him once embodied. These creatures born from the depths of Tolkien's creativity continue to captivate and inspire, not only within the pages of his works, but also beyond. And I might also add here, as a Welshman myself, dragons are just awesome. As we reflect on the dragons of Middle-earth, we recognise their symbolic significance, embodiments of power and mystery. These dragons, with their diverse traits and narratives, stand as testament to Tolkien's unparalleled ability to infuse life into mythical beings, shaping a world that continues to enchant generations and inviting us to soar on wings of imagination into the boundless realms of Middle-earth. Glaurung and Caligon the Black, Scatha, Smaug. I instilled terror in the hearts of men. I am king under the mountain. With that now though, it is time for my question of the day, which is, do you have a favourite dragon and why? Is it Smaug because we seem to see more of him? Or perhaps Glowing is something different and that brings him out on top? Let me know all of your thoughts and opinions on this in the comment section down below. And now to shout out our patrons. You guys have been amazing in supporting our short film project. We have got some amazing updates coming soon. We are really making good progress and I cannot thank you all enough. We have the Divine Power tier member of Kevin, the Fire Demon tier member of Nasheath, and the Wizard Staff tier members of John, Andrew, and Hunter. You are all true legends of the Pro Hero. Finally, I really appreciate your time in watching this video today. If you've enjoyed the content, please consider hitting that subscribe button and the bell icon with notifications enabled so that you will get notified when all future videos are released. Thank you once again for your support, and I look forward to seeing you next time on The Broken Sword.